Special, special podcast for you today. I uh, have a very special guest with us, Tom Shea, author of Unbreakable, 23-year Navy SEAL. We're excited about this podcast. We have Tyler Harris and Joseph Caldwell here, and we all three are the Sales Wolves. Uh-hoo! We gotta have that's, a how. That's totally wrong. <laughs> <laughs> that's totally wrong. <laughs> yeah, so we were kind of offline. We were talking about how I got here. And uh, the topic was, you know, when did I move here? So I'll I'll start again. So I I retired four years ago after 23 years of being a SEAL. And you'd ask, you know, where I'd lived. I only live in two places. SEALs don't actually travel. They travel all the time, but they don't live in multiple places like most military. And I checked into SEAL training as an instructor September 9th, 2001. (laughs) And prior to that, I'd had a great career at SEAL Team 2. Uh, we'd been involved in you know, combat missions in Kosovo, and we rescued the U.S. ambassador who, had, who was in Macedonia during the, the Kosovo you know, stuff that was going on. And we thought those were interesting wars because they were the only game in town. They, were, they paled in comparison to what happened in 2001. Mm-hmm. And so I'm here I am checking in myself and my family and starting this new life as an instructor, thinking that it was going to be easier. Hmm. And then the, the towers get hit. And I remember me driving across the bridge prior to it all going on. I'm listening to the radio and I hear from my vantage point, some idiot just crashed into the tower because mm-hmm. you know, I'm not watching it. Sure. And, and then there's that, that delay in what happened. The, yeah. the one hits and then there's a delay. I check into the third phase, which is, the, you know, SEAL training has three phases, and I was a leading petty officer of third phase. So I'm checking in, we're watching TV, and everybody's like, what a joke, what an idiot, because nobody saw it when it actually happened. Mm-hmm. And we're all sitting there looking at the TV, and you see the plane flying in from the back. It hits, and everybody walked over to the armory and got guns. Hmm. There was somebody in the armory open it going, okay, it's business time. Wow. So all the instructors are now over there. They shut down training for about six hours so that we could figure out what was going on. And we were kind of manning the rails because you know, you never know. Sure. Yeah. And so all the guys that were just in the, in the process of checking in were trying to check out. Go, hey, we <laughs> want to go back to a team. We don't want to be here when, that's right. Right. when all the fun happens. So it was an interesting experience of... Now, Isn't that funny how he looks at it? Mm-hmm. Like, this is where the fun begins. Yeah, we don't yeah. want to be on the admin side. Oh, yeah. yeah. So we actually, it was actually more, I don't know more, it was actually interesting to now be an instructor training people knowingly going to war. You knew the guys that you were going to train were going to get in the thick of it quick. Yeah. And the intensity went up. So it was, it was intense anyway. Sure. Like SEAL training is so difficult anyway. And now the skipper, a guy named uh, Rick Smithers came out and said, I don't care if anybody graduates. <laughs> we only want quality. We're not going to push anybody through because we now know these guys are going to, you know, be our brothers that if they're not up to speed, mm. don't let them pass. <laughs> And uh, so it was intense, uh, like you read about. Mm. But, and, it, and it ended up the same percentage of failures, which is a fun conversation. <laughs> so yeah. throughout the history of SEAL, of SEAL, the SEAL training, 10 to 15% graduate. So the top guys anyway, and you know, athletically and smartest whips, like I think the smartest people I've met have, have been in SEAL training. Wow. And most of the smartness is not from education. Like they can figure out things without a background. Hmm. So historically, 85% fail. Like my class started out with 111, and we graduated 11. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And you think of yeah. these guys, most to get, in, to get into SEAL training, 
lot of things have to happen. The first thing is you uh, have to do 100 push-ups in, in two minutes. That's to get in. The pa- to, to, to pass the test, it's only 65, but the competition is so great that you have to do two minutes of push-ups and get 100 because hmm. they only take the top percentile. Hmm. And you have to do 100 sit-ups in two minutes. And then you have to do unbroken pull-ups and to get into training. So the 111 people that made it into training, all of them did over 20 pull-ups, wow. which not, it's not that bad, but you think all the disparate mm-hmm. people. And you have to swim, uh, I think, 800 meters in a certain time. I can't remember what the time was. And you have to run three miles in less than 19 minutes, which is quick. So now right. you have these guys that are strong and quick mm-hmm. and have endurance going on. <laughs> That's just to get in. So the 111 could do that to get in. <laughs> And then they quit, which probably is the best topic to start on Mm -hmm. is what I think that, and what I found now, jumping ahead. So what I found now is uh, I, there's two keys to success that I can pin down in everybody. And it's different than what everybody, everybody else looks at success. The first key or pillar to being successful is you have to honor the words that come out of your mouth. When you say something, if it ain't true for you and you're not going to back it up with all your energy and effort or time, mm-hmm. you're going to fail. The second one is don't quit. Mm-hmm. If you can't have those two elements working in tandem, there's not very much that's going to happen for you. And uh, now I've made it kind of a life out of uh, teaching that very intimately to individuals or businesses. Everybody wants to succeed. We're going to go back to the basics. Absolutely. Say something. Let's see if you can carry it out. Yep, and uh, which kind of leads to. It's funny when you said there's two keys and it's what most people don't think that it is. In my head, I was like, I'm going to guess them and see if I get them right. Mm-hmm. And uh, in my head, I guessed. Um, and it, it wasn't fair because I've read your stuff, but in my, in my, in my head, I was like, start and don't quit, start and don't quit. That's the first thing that came into my mind. I got the first one wrong. Um, <laughs> but, uh, well, you know, I, maybe that is, uh, maybe the second order of, uh, honoring your word is mm-hmm. once you honor your word, you're going to start something. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. Truly. You got to get in the game somehow. Got to. Mm-hmm. And the only way to get in the game is to make a promise mm-hmm. that I'm going to do a, B or C and carry it out and I'll probably ask you this how many times during the day or week or month do you want to quit on something or do you see other people quit every single day, <laughs> every single day. <clears throat> yeah now we talked about this yesterday or I don't know if it was on t- I talked to you so much but you didn't want to <laughs> stay and do the uh, you didn't want to stay there yesterday mm. right you didn't want to stay and finish out what was what was going on and you didn't want to turn around and go back after you got called again but mm-hmm. it's part of what you do you yeah, honored your word yeah yeah that makes sense and i think part of what you with honoring your word because that encompasses a pretty big deal like you're mm-hmm. talking about with the action um going back to what he said in the beginning was when they i, I keep going back to that one when, when he said they all went for their they all went for their guns they didn't want to be an admin side of that they mm-hmm. wanted and all I thought about was Jordan. And what did he want? When the buzzer was hitting, tie score, what did he want? The ball. Mm-hmm. He wanted to be the one with the ball. And I think that all successful people um, and people on their way to success want to be the – they want to go out. They want to be in they, – they want to be in the game, mm-hmm. right? They want, to, they want it to depend on. They want to take the risk. And uh, so. Yeah, I've, I've talked about my dad – I uh, was in the third range of battalion mm. and the, the period of time that he was in the military was during peace times mm-hmm. and it got to the point where his next step was, was some type of admin. It was some type of uh, desk job basically. Mm-hmm. And he was just, he very clearly was just like, that's, that's not why I'm here. Mm-hmm. And, um, and then that's when he uh, got out. And to this day, I, I, I know for a fact to this day, it's the it's the biggest thing that just hangs is that he practiced for nine years yeah. and never got to get in the game. And huh. having that mentality is to me is unbelievable. Yeah. Um, it's it's powerful. 
for sure. What years? What years was he? In? He got out in eighty. Uh, let's see. He was captain third ranger battalion when he got out in eighty seven, I believe. And Tyler was born nine months later. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> my granddad uh, was chief of staff at Fort Benning as well hmm. um, so he was, my granddad was chief of staff from I think at the time it was like the longest tenured uh, chief of staff it was from he retired in 85 uh, so it would have been from 78 to 85 he was chief of staff down at Fort uh, Fort Benning mm-hmm. and um, so yeah we had a lot of a lot of military background. It's funny when you talked about moving and how seals don't really live in a lot of places. They just mm-hmm. move around. My people always ask us with what we do um, if I was in the military, which I was not. Um, but I tell them every time I tell them the story. I said, "Well, you know, when I got towards the end of high school, having both sides of family being military, uh, I said my mom had moved fifty-two times, and mm-hmm. my dad had moved fifty, I think fifty-one times. Oh and so I was kind of make a joke of it, and I said, "Well, and at that time, my mom said you're going to college, you're not doing the same thing." And yes, ma'am was really the only available mm-hmm. option that I had as an, as a response. Oh, so that's what I did. Because your, your dad <laughs> probably enforced that. <laughs> You had the idea of wanting to be in the military. There was there was a time a period of time where I did, and you know my dad he never he he didn't talk about it. Um, we didn't. It wasn't something that he, it certainly wasn't something that he pushed, but it wasn't really something that he even mentioned the thought of. Um, mm-hmm. There was a small period of time where I was where I was looking at it. Um, Thirteen people in my family went to North Georgia College uh, there in Dahlonega, and then a lot of uh, military. Um, well, yeah, it never, it, it, that was really, that literally was the conversation. You're going to go to college and not do the same thing? Yes, ma'am. Well, it's funny they pushed the opposite. Uh, so, you know, my dad was military. He was a West Point grad, and uh, we kind of come from a military background, you know, extended families, and a lot of military. And other than me, I just grew up in that mindset where I wanted to be a SEAL from you know, my early memories of, you know, when I started going through puberty, okay, I want to be a SEAL. <laughs> and because I, we grew up with a guy that was a kind of precursor to SEALs in World War II, he was the first guy to put his feet on the sand on a small island called Vela La Vela. He and another SEAL, it was called uh, Scouts and Raiders then. They were. They went on shore to blow up all the Jap scullies, wow. huh. and uh, he was captured. And long story, uh, other than it was a cool story, it's not really relevant. So I grew up knowing this guy, and he got his feet skinned by the Japanese. Thought that he wouldn't run away. Uh, escapes, swims out through the surf with skinned feet. And so I'm like, God, this guy's incredible. I want some of that. Like every dumb kid wants something stupid. And so uh, my dad said, you're not ever going to go on the SEAL teams, ever. And uh, so I'm like, well, I want to be a soldier, a warrior somehow. So I went to West Point and failed out after my third year. So the beginning of most greatness, I think, always comes from failure. Always. Always. And it wasn't a soft, sandy bottom that I hit. It was the rock bottom. So I was a great football player. I was recruited to go to Tennessee. I go to West Point, and I play ball there, and I'm on the judo team, and everything's working out. And then it ends. Nobody wanted me. I couldn't even get into another school. Hmm. And so I begged, borrow, and steal to complete my degree at uh, uh, Ball State University in Indiana. And in the middle of my senior year there, I'm like, I do not want to do this. I don't like the admin side of it. I missed out on something that I wanted. And without parents, because I didn't need their approval anymore, I went down to the recruiting office and signed up for the SEAL program. And mom and dad were like, what are you doing? Like, I I have to do this. I have to. Mm -hmm. So I ended up in SEAL program and first time through failed not failed, I got injured. So I had to get set back. Mm-hmm. Then I, second time through, I got set back. Third time through. Injury again? Back. Injury, injury. Mm-hmm. Cause that, All the same injury or? 
No, first one was uh, I got a concussion. And second one was... Was that, that self-inflicted or did somebody <laughs> inflict that upon me? No, out, out in Coronado uh, on that peninsula, there's a rock uh, jetty that goes out from the uh, Hotel Dell. If you haven't been there, it's a big, beautiful hotel right on the island of Coronado. And there's a rock jetty that goes out in the ocean and you have to land your Zodiac boats on it during high surf. And, you know, it's dangerous as shit. Tell the truth. <laughs> yeah. And so I was the first guy out of the boat and you have to grab a rock and grab the bow line and the boat goes out and you're holding it. And then the next wave comes in and I'm here, <laughs> rock, head, boat, bam. And I'm like, okay, that's it. Sayonara. And so I end up yeah. in the hospital recovering from that. Then I dislocate my shoulder the next hell week and uh, got a little delay in training, get to start again. Now it's winter phase and you're in the winter hell week in the Pacific Ocean and the water is not, ch not chilly. It's scary. <laughs> and uh, so I got pneumonia the wow. third time through and you don't recover from pneumonia. It's easier to recover from a broken bone than pneumonia. So they gave me a week off. And I had to start the next training with pneumonia Jeez. or quit. So your option is always stay or go. Yeah. And you choose either one. And I'm like, I cannot go home. I cannot go home having quit. This I'd is rather the fourth die. time going in. Yeah, so fourth time. And uh, I said, I'd rather die. I cannot face that again. I'm not going to go back with my tail between my legs. And end up, woke up in the hospital the fourth time with all five lobes infiltrated with fluid hmm. and they kicked me out of training and I'm like, Oh my God, I cannot do this. I cannot show up again asking dad for help. And I'm like, I'm going to stay and I'm going to make it back. Usually it takes two years to get back into training because you know, you had your chance and now you're out. And I kept writing, request to go back in the admiral of the hospital because I was a corpsman at the time. He's like, oh my God, just get out of here. <laughs> Every week I'd submit a new chit and everybody hated me. I'm like, I'm out. I'm not going to be in the regular Navy. I, I cannot tolerate kind of being normal. Mm. And so I make it back into training in that, in that class, 207, 111 start, 11 completed. And, uh, but it was all based on if you give up on yourself, you're stuffed. Yeah. Mm. And, so, you know, legit reasons. Sure. You know, my shoulder doesn't work. <laughs> my, I can't breathe. Mm. And uh, what I learned from that experience is, hey, you said you were going to be here. I don't care what happens now. You said you were going to be here. And don't give up. Mm. In the face of, you know, overwhelming obstacles. So I took that into the rest of my career. And, you know, combat is so overwhelming that had it not, my experience not been predicated on, you know, honor your word and not give up. There were a thousand reasons to give up. Hmm. You run out of ammo. Okay, that's legit. I mean, I can convince you, <laughs> hey, put your hands up. And uh, so it culminated in, in 2009, I'm a SEAL platoon chief, took a group of SEALs or a platoon of SEALs over to Afghanistan. And it was busy time. We got, we basically ran out of food, water, and ammo every time we went out hmm. massive firefights and reasons to quit are so available <laughs> mm. you can just take a step and go okay there's a reason okay there's a mine there's another great reason <laughs> okay we're getting shot at it's 120 degrees outside and we just kept finding a reason to stay in you know parallel perpendicular reasons doesn't matter mm -hmm. stay in the game don't give up keep moving and keep moving keep trying to solve a problem that's un and that they're not solvable. Mm -hmm. The only, the only solution is get to the chopper, mm -hmm. <laughs> keep fighting until the, the, they come and rescue you and get you out mm -hmm. of there. And, uh, the guys did phenomenally well because, uh, it was predicated on those two pillars. Yep. And I mean, I don't know what and kind that, of experience do y'all have that is that, probably similar it, with you saying that, that is, it rings so true. Um, I remember, so I've been married 18 years. We've been together 21 years. So my wife has known me a long time and has known me through the predominant, the predominant time we've been together, I, I failed at the different things that I've, mm -hmm. I've come across. I mean, from failing in business three different times, from, from 
you know, it, the failures at some point, at one point were so overwhelming, but I just wouldn't stop. And I literally remember not letting sleep, nothing. <laughs> I would just, I would keep at it, keep going. And I remember the look in her eye at one point where, you know, if, if ever we were around other friends and, you know, their husbands had a nine to five job and, you know, they had the little cookie cutter house and the pool mm-hmm. and the two kids and all the stuff. And I remember seeing that look in her eye, that longing for normal. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I remember her looking at me and she never said it because when she looked at me one time, I literally looked at her and I was like, I hate normal. Mm-hmm. I was like, you didn't marry average. I will not be it. And, and I could see it. I could see it. Like, how are we going to pay these bills? How are we oh, going to yeah. do this? How are we going to, how are, the wolves are at the door, constantly at the door, not for six months, not for a year, for years. Oh, yeah. I mean, beaten at the door. And sometimes the wolves slept in the same bed. I mean, <laughs> I mean these wolves were everywhere. They took, you know, had stuff taken from us. And as you were talking about that, you can find an excuse anywhere you look for yeah. one. And I don't care where somebody's at. Um, I had a plethora of excuses. Did, did you know what that word means? I do. I'll teach you later. If Cornucopia. You know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very happy. I mean, never mind. Tyler's actually really good at stuff like that. I, sometimes he'll be sitting there and we'll be talking about something and, and we'll be disagreeing on it. And he's like, oh, okay, yeah, yeah. And then I'll get, it's not 15 minutes later. Like, I don't even know how he did it, but I'll get a 17 page email, like the most well worded email I've ever gotten in my life. And I'm overwhelmed once again. (laughs) But, um, man, you you hit the nail on the head, man. And people that look for it, excuses are skin of reason stuffed with a lie. And you can, you can pick any one of them up and it will keep you from taking that next step forward. Um, I think there was something interesting that you said, and we kind of, and it kind of just got skimmed over, and and I would be interested to know within those eighty five percent that quit, mm-hmm. what you said is that I'm doing this because I have to do it, versus someone doing it because they want to do it or they'd like to try, versus you were saying I have to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, one of my best friends in the world, um, Matt Hegler. Matt Hegler, yeah, I love so it. Matt, we went to we went to Clemson uh, together, and he was a year younger. I had graduated, and uh, he was um, starting his senior year, and and this guy was just a big meathead. I mm-hmm. mean, was strong as an ox, but was heavy set, just big, just big yeah. meathead. And all of a sudden, out of the blue, one day reminds he, me of someone else sitting at the table. And it's not me or him. <laughs> I'm getting better. Um, but he he came out one day. I can remember as clear as day. He, he said, I'm going to be a Navy SEAL. I'm like, what? what? I mean, yeah. no part of it made sense. You're one of Clemson University. Mm-hmm. You're drinking every weekend, you know, acting a fool, no discipline. Like, what? <laughs> okay, sure. And from that day forward, it's like he had he had drawn a line in the sand. And from that day forward, he quit drinking, quit partying. Um, his diet, exercise, he had zero swimming background mm-hmm. whatsoever. He started swimming every single day for mm-hmm. hours. Um, graduated that year, enlisted in the Navy, uh, went to Bud's. Um, he, he, had, um, he had to do the, the LASIK, I guess the PRK mm-hmm. or whatever mm-hmm. they make you do um, for his LASIK. But then made it. He made it through first first round through um, into seal uh, to become What's a seal. What's his last name? Uh, Hegler, Matt Hegler. Um, he was on a seal team in uh, Hawaii. He was based in Hawaii mm. for. So he was a big guy, and they put him in Hawaii. Poor guy. Well, see, but, so but that's the, but that's the thing. Yeah. He was a big guy when he came out there and said that to us. Mm. When he left, he was nothing but skin, bone, really? and muscle. Mm-hmm. Uh, probably lost. 70 pounds. Oh, wow. Okay. I mean, he had a 12 pack. I mean, mm-hmm. he's I have, in I incredible have, shape now. I have pictures of him. We used to have like a little band. So that's a whole Like other musical? Story. Yeah. That's awesome. And he played <laughs> We're going to, that's a topic for another podcast. <laughs> yeah, 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 right? <laughs> and so, and so he's an incredible at the guitar. He's unbelievable. He actually took classical guitar lessons growing up. He's unbelievable. Uh, but I have pictures of him from college and he just had this big fat neck and he's just sitting there playing the guitar. And then I have pictures from we had a little party for him when he left. And I mean, just a specimen. Um, 
but that was his mentality. He's like, I have to do this. Mm -hmm. And, and so I would wonder from, I would love to hear from you. I mean, what, did you sense that from people, the people that were there just to say that they tried to they say that they went in? That's a topic. So the, what goes on inside of people is 10 times more important mm -hmm. than you have any idea. So I don't know if, how to phrase that better. So everybody, male, female, is, has an internal battle. Mm -hmm. I just coin it differently. I call what they say to themselves inside is really the biggest driver of action is what's going on inside. Mm -hmm. How can somebody be doing underwater basket weaving and then the next day pivot? Mm -hmm. It's not clear to anybody on the outside, on the inside, that's the death of a thousand cuts for that person. Mm -hmm. They've thought about it. They're like, I, screw it. I'm turning left here. And everybody's like, God, what are they doing? And I call that uh, internal dialogue. What they're saying to themselves is the biggest driver. But nobody teaches people what to say to themselves. They're just in that battle alone. And so the 85% of people that don't make it through SEAL training. So there's three ways out. Break mm -hmm. physically. Fail a subject or a test a physical test or, you know, an academic test or quit. So if all the hundred percent of people don't make it through, so of that 85%, call that a hundred percent. 4% can't pass tests. Okay. Maybe 6% medically can't make it through. So they break something or get hurt. So we're at 90% quit. Golly, quit! That is shocking. So it's just mental. And it, well, yeah, it's mental. On, but it feels like it's real. Uh, yeah. The reasons to quit are real, mm -hmm. except for the the people that know how to internally process it. Just don't listen to it anymore. Mm -hmm. Just stop listening to the reasons to quit. Don't process it as an available option. <laughs> Okay, you don't have any money anymore. Don't process it as an available option. I love that. You know, are we going to be able... I don't have enough gas in the car. How many people wouldn't even try to get on the trip? There's not enough gas to get to Atlanta. 15% will we'll figure it out. We don't have enough money. Okay, somebody get out of the car. We're going to park at a parking lot and somebody... Everybody else get out and let's figure out how to get gas now. Mm. Walk around the parking lot and figure out how many pennies are on the ground. Go to the next parking lot. I thought you were going to say siphon it out of other or, people's cars. I was like, I was <laughs> like that's that? where I was going. <laughs> <laughs> so, but you know, most people don't even know there's a solution. They're presented with a problem that mm. has no option. Mm -hmm. They don't even try to process it. Mm. They just look at what they call reality. Mm. I don't think things are necessarily real. It's how you process them. And so what happens in SEAL training is we're going to give you a thousand ways to quit. They'll feel like the right reason to quit. So when you can't open your eyes, you're so cold. So I always, I think it's relevant and I think it's relevant in the business community, the story that I'm about to tell. So the smart people throughout history of SEAL training put in a section of training called Hell Week. So it's because the SEAL community is based on honor your word and don't give up, mm. not tactics. So we're going to give you a problem, solve it, without even knowing the solution up front. So if you're going to make a promise, you better keep it. Mm. So this Hell Week is design, designed by some smart people. It's designed to break you down to the point where you're raw again. And so the first part of hell week is called breakout, but it's called confusion. Mm -hmm. So, you know, up front, you're going to get woken up in a tent at night and you're not going to go to sleep until Friday. So Sunday you wake up, mm -hmm. there's no guarantees until the skipper comes out and says, you're done. And you never know when he's going to come out. So, most people need something 
to grasp onto to continue. So you take that away in the first hour and a half. So you break out of the tent. It's confusing, confusing, and they're like, put sand in your mouth. Dude, what do you mean put sand in my mouth? Put a mask on with sand. Dude, I can't keep doing this because there's no reason to do it anymore. Mm -hmm. Like, I want to be a warrior Navy SEAL. I want to do all that stuff. And then they take it all from you. Mm -hmm. So they don't let you win at all. So do something that has no bearing on being a SEAL. Mm -hmm. Roll around in the sand. Sing songs. Get a, a, a water hose sprayed in your eyes. And you can't, I mean, it's a water torture. Mm -hmm. And uh, We were going to actually ask you that. We talked about it on the last podcast. I would have something is, you forgot. Is there any way that you can? We want to Torture document you guys? This. waterboard. <laughs> no, we want to waterboard Tyler on a podcast and see how long he can take. Remember, we talked about that. I no, I agreed to it. He did agree to it, and I was like, "Well, there, Tom's it, coming on. It's and maybe actually Tom can do it. easier to break somebody down without that." So, <laughs> anyway, so Sorry, an hour, <laughs> hour and a half, hour and a half of confusion. There are people that quit right then. So that's week five. Okay. So I've. So you're a student, you've gone through the beginning of SEAL training and you're getting in shape and you're passing these hard tests and they're beating you and abusing you for your advantage. So Hell Week is to the advantage of the student. We want you to hit rock bottom and build yourself back. And we're going to not let you build yourself back. We're going to prevent you from doing it. And you got to fight your way into the community. So again, an hour and a half of problems that you are not relevant at all. <laughs> So like in business, give somebody a problem that has nothing to do with them making money. They're like, I want to make money. Okay, go go uh, polish the floor with your T-shirt. Mm -hmm. God, what am I doing? Why am I doing this? Mm -hmm. So if you need a why to continue, they take it from you. Hmm. Like you, yeah, hear on the, you hear on the mass media, you know, have a really strong why. Yeah. No. Hmm. That's not the key. So overcoming well, that right off the bat. Hmm. So people quit right off the bat. They're like, oh my gosh, it's not hard. It's just dumb. Why am I doing this? Hmm. And you don't get an answer. Gosh. And then you project that forward going, hmm, I don't know if I want to continue. So this internal processing starts happening immediately. And these are people that know that this is coming. Oh, yeah. Because they've heard story after story yeah. after story, but they're still. And you can download the whole thing. Yeah. Now. And you can figure out how to be a SEAL. While watching it on, you know, TV now, mm -hmm. and then you're faced with the problem. Okay, whew, damn. Okay, this is hard now. It's way different. When <laughs> this you're is in a it. little serious now, and I don't know if I can process this now till Friday. And then they immediately take you in the surf zone and give you no way out. So, you know, like a if let's do a physical test. If you pass it, then you can move on. Now in the surf zone in the cold water. Mm -hmm. There's no way out. You have to deal with it. Undetermined amount of time. So from the instructor, there's no hope. There's no hope. You can't hope hold on to gone. hope. Like gosh, if I you do don't can't hold on to a why. You can't hold on yeah. to hope. These are the things that everybody ties everything to. Yeah. Now this is so fascinating. And so if you take those, so now you, but you have to viscerally process this. So you're in the surf zone from the student point of view. Now I've done five of them from the student point of view. So I knew. On the fifth one, I kind of knew it to anticipate. Didn't help. You still got to go do it. I'm like, oh, God dang it. And you don't know if you're going to make it. You don't know if that one extra straw is just going to blow up on you. So the students out there go, okay, I can do this. I can do this. And from the instructor point of view, we're just going to get everybody's core temperature down to around 94, which is scary temperature. Mm. You, you start shivering at 98. Mm. You know, you're internally... It goes from 98, 98.6 to 98, you're shivering. You stop shivering at 96 because <laughs> then you shunt all the blood away from your extremities and your brain and your heart and your lungs Start are the only thing cold. that matters. Mm -hmm. And we want to get everybody down below that where they stop shivering. You're in a panic when you're shivering. You stop panicking when you stop shivering. <laughs> so the students are out there and then they, they're out there for about an hour and a half. And then you pull them out of the water. A surgeon comes by and you're looking in everybody's eyes and you're making them say something. Okay, he's good. And some people are beginning to not process, like their nervous system shutting down. Yeah. And you're like, okay, back in the water. Ooh. Making them turn around. 
and they can't get back in. They're like, oh my God, I got to do that again because I can't fight it anymore. I have to go do that. And I know it's those lining up for get kicked in the balls. Like, oh my God, I can't do it again. <laughs> and so they go back out in the water and uh, that second time is brutal because you're like, hmm, I survived the first one. Because I could warm myself up, and now it, you're like I can't warm myself up anymore. So on the second iteration out, so I was an instructor. I put through 16 classes, so 16 hell weeks I participated in from the leadership point of view. The second iteration out, you've had some random quitters in the first evolution, and the first time in the water, you get random quitters. What happens in the second one? Who quits? Who quits? The the best dude quits every time. Like that guy you look at and go, he's a tough, definitely a hombre. They're the fastest. They're the they look (laughs) smartest. They pass all. They're the most aggressive vocally. Yeah, Hmm. and they're like, God dang, that guy's impressive. Like even from an instructor point of view, you're like, okay, who's the top guy in class? Because you're always evaluating everybody. (laughs) So the students and the instructors. What do you attribute that to? Because they can't win. They can't beat it. They can't talk themselves. They can't perform better. And they're sitting there going. Oh my God. So when they're taking all their advantage away, everything away. So they can't win. When he leaves, when the number one dude leaves, it's like a domino. So the top guy leaves the bottom guys. If he can't, because if he can't do it, then how in the world am I going to be able to do it? Yeah. So all these now internally, everybody's processing this going, if he can't do it, I'm out. Okay. That's a good excuse. Now, number one guy's out. I'm out. So everybody, you see these guys stand up and their buddies are trying to grab them. But once somebody processes, it's over. I quit, they're done. You can't talk them back in. You can push them back into class. They're going to find the next reason out. Yeah. So they quit. And then you, you know that second, that second evolution is going to create the biggest quitter, you know, pool. And they all ring the bell. They leave, and then you bring the students that are remaining out of the water, and they you check them again. And some of them are really going south. They're not processing things. Mm-hmm. And you're like, all right, t- everybody take off all your clothes. <laughs> the, the last barrier protects mental protection. So you're in the water. It doesn't really matter. Right. So you take that last le- le- layer off, and but they get panicked. literally like you're dripping everything. Yeah, done. Yep. And so yeah. having done it as a student, you're like, I can't even unbutton my shirt because your fingers <laughs> like, <"Hey." laughs> and you take your pants off and your boots and you're like, oh, I gotta get back in it. And they just ha- don't have it. And they go back and sit in the water and they're done. But you can see they're about ready to go. Oh, I don't know about this anymore. And you let them stew for a while, but now it's dangerous. They're mm. so cold that medically you got to warm them up. So you, you say, all right, everybody out of the water in a lot of foul languages because they're not able to do things by themselves. You have to actually touch them and push them and yell at them because they're not processing. Yeah. You know, they don't hear you. You're like, ah, you're yelling at them. And they're like, ah. <laughs> and so they put their clothes back on. You're like, all right, idiots. If you four mile time run, if you don't get it in less than 30 minutes, you're kicked out of training. How many people quit? Before they even start, which is a start point. Oh, I bet there's you a lot of people that quit before they start. They're like, I can't do this, so I'm not even going to start it. Huh. Yeah. So some a lot of people quit. That then, makes perfect sense. And they run. I saw people get faster times. Some people get faster times than their times when they were prepared. Huh. Wow. Medically, you can't. Physiologically, there's no way to get a fast time. Because my heart is about done and my lungs aren't, and my muscles aren't processing. Right. So they run down four miles and come back. Just, I don't know what the percentage is. Say half the class passes. They get to go over to a fire and warm up. The ones that fail, in back the in the ocean. So a couple quit. Do they, do they know that beforehand? No, they don't know okay. anything. Okay. Unless they have been in hell week. Sure, sure. 
So they, they once they go in the Can water. Can you imagine not getting it and then going back in the water? Yeah. And you're like, oh, man, I'm, I'm going to fail. They're going to kick me out. And then the lead instructor, one of the officers or warrant officers comes out and says, uh, all right, we know it was cold. We're going to give you one more chance. If you quit or if you don't make it, you're out. No questions asked. So they're like, I didn't make it the first time. How am I going to do it now? So a lot of people quit because they can't do it. They knew they couldn't do it, so they don't even start or tow the line again. So the ones that tow the line the second time, you can never make them quit again in their life because they they don't have to have a why. They don't have to win. They just get in it again. They're going to get back in the game without a solution. All those guys are the ones that do well in their career. The ones that pass the first run, the rest of Helwick is to, to break them down. Because you know you're not going to get them to quit. They may break. I mean, they may injure themselves. Mm-hmm. But you know those guys, not to worry about it. So the instructor's like, I don't care about those guys anymore. It's this guy over here. I'm going to wear this dude by the fire I'm, out. Yeah, I'm going <laughs> to figure his stuff out. So you mm-hmm. then everybody's assigned, every instructor's assigned a bunch of kids to go, all right, let's figure out what your problem is. You don't ask the dude. You're like, all right, you know, handstand push-ups on the boat, go. Until he breaks down to a certain point in time. And you know, Helwick has other conversations, but those three things of overcoming your why, mm-hmm. overcoming not winning, and then overcoming excessive failure and then towing the line again, those are the huge indicators of future success. If he doesn't have to have a why, he's just going to do it because he said he is. Okay, it's stupid. I'm going to do it anyway. And then the reasons to quit are so <laughs> – you could write down – every student could write down a thousand reasons that mm-hmm. he encountered. Everything you just explained. I didn't have a hell week. I had like a 15 years in business that hell, were like that. Hell moments. Yeah, yeah. No, 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 the whole time mm-hmm. was, was, <laughs> was reasons like that. And, and it's so funny as you're talking – I am, uh, it actually has gotten me really excited, you know, um, because God, I can sit here and talk about failure after failure after failure. I mean, in relationships and marriage and, and as a dad, as a business owner, as, I mean, as an employee, I'm not sure that I ever didn't get fired from the job I had. I mean, I failed at a lot of stuff. I mean, it was over and repeated and repeated. But uh, but always learning from each one and going, God, I can't do that again, mm-hmm. you know. And so anyway, do you, do you feel like when you when you when you strip them down to where you're you're eliminating? It seems to me like you're eliminating everything that they've learned or been taught or developed. It almost to a point. Do you feel like it's almost like someone's born with the ability to continue or or to quit? No, I don't okay. think so. Uh, Genetic predisposition, I, I, don't, I don't see that it's relevant in the world. Okay. Uh, take that to the nth degree. So the Usain Bolts of the world. Mm. Okay, he may be designed where he has a, an, enough torque in his ankle. Sure. Because of the right angle of displacement, mm. whatever the mm. you know math that's going on there. Doesn't make him run. Mm-hmm. Something's going on inside that's making him run. Right. The, you know, what is success? I don't even know if I have a definition mm-hmm. except for the fact that that person started something and found a way to finish it. Mm-hmm. Whether they're, I don't know if number one is the key indicator of success. So, you know, the Usain Bolt consideration, uh, he's considered number one. Who's number two? And how many seconds difference is it? Mm-hmm. A millisecond. Yep. Yeah. Nobody considers what this guy does, just <laughs> what Usain Bolt does. Mm-hmm. So I, I bring up that, is it genetics or is there something else that m- is more available to human beings than genetic predisposition? Mm-hmm. Like, were you born to do this? Mm-hmm. God, I don't know. But you're, but you're breaking them down to a level that's so deep it's it's beyond anything that they've learned or been taught right i mean you're 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 breaking them down to it's stuff that's deep 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 inside them that that gives them the ability to 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 stay or leave and it may not be a genetic predisposition Mm -hmm. but it's something that's 
extremely deep inside them that one person has versus one person doesn't for whatever. For, he's, for what whatever he's saying, reason. maybe I'm yeah, wrong. So but what you're saying is that you, they're choosing. Is that each person could choose? Yeah, yeah. So from an outside point of view, maybe it seems that you're breaking them down to see what they have mm. at the cellular level or genetic level. We want to see if this guy has learned the right thing and able to impart the right thing at the right time. I don't think that's what's going on. Okay. Uh, nobody gets broken down by somebody else. They break themselves down. This is great. Uh, they don't. So I could yell at you. How you process it is more important than me yelling at you. Hmm. You know, anger from one person to the other is always the stupid idiot that's angry. It has nothing to do with that person. It's me being angry at you that I impart that anger. It's not because of what that person does. I don't mean to get off track, but so in in life and in seal seal training is just a little aspect of overall life. I think uh, you so the students that want to go there think they know what being a seal is. Hmm. It has no bearing on reality. You know what I mean? SEAL training is not real. In the platoons, when you're actually in combat, that's real. But what that life is like has nothing to do with what you thought it was going to be like. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So they come to training and they're interested in their own breakdown. If they're not interested in their own breakdown, they can't get through. Uh, so they're the ones that are willing to go deeper and deeper and deeper. So the answer to how deep somebody goes is eventually you stop going deep yourself. You're like, I'm not going to go deep anymore. I'm going to keep it all on the surface. And on the surface, I promise to get here and mm -hmm. stay here. And I'm not going to go so deep that I can find a reason to leave. I'm just going to keep it all on the surface. And it's counterintuitive, and I don't know if I explained that very well. Because you can go deep and find reasons to not do anything and then make it valid and then get in a support group that allows you to validate your reason <laughs> to quit. Oh, yeah, sure. You know? mm -hmm. But you're the one that went so deep, you found the reason to leave. Mm -hmm. So I want to bring it to the surface. What are the reasons that people fail? In, like I would ask you, what are the reasons that even in your business, people don't do well? I think one of the big things is not being willing to go all in, not being willing to put in a 100% effort into it is what I see. They're risk times. averse. It's caution. You know, I, I talk about a lot about with, with me for a period of time that, that I had a fear of going all in because of an experience early on in my life mm -hmm. where I did and it was taken away from me. Mm -hmm. And I had this fear of, of going all in and, and having that taken away from me. So I almost used it as a crutch for mm -hmm. probably five, six years where I would fail and I would say, well, you know, of course I failed. I wasn't, I wasn't really going all in. You know, I wasn't really trying my, my best. If I had tried my best, I, I'd have crushed it, but I didn't. So that's why I failed. And it's mm -hmm. almost like I used that as, this excuse for for years and then finally finally shedding that and, and being able to go all in for me was was a big difference okay so what is that I asked a dumb question so what does that sound like in, in your head so either so sometimes it's hard to look at the mirror and see what that is so when you are working with other people either in the business or outside what are the actual excuses or reasons that people use that kind of diminish the success story? What do you hear them say? God, I which is a litany of stuff, man. Um, it's usually and, one and, is and I can't. selling yeah. with selling life insurance. Yeah, I can't is mm -hmm. is a big or one. Or nobody, they'll say no. Nobody. nobody can do this in this territory. Nobody yeah, no, yeah. can do yeah. this in this territory. And we're always like, well, you're right. Because if that's what they think, then. Then you've already true. You've already made you can't decision. convince. Uh, you can't, convince, you can't convince anybody of anything. They have to do it themselves. It's a fact. Yeah. So we've stopped trying. Like when you said that that, that you can't convince a little while ago when you were talking about the seal training, I was I about kicked your chair. I was like, we've stopped trying to convince people, you know, mm -hmm. which is 
probably why our success is, is moving more rapid mm -hmm. now is that we, we realize when somebody says that they've already made the internal decision, mm -hmm. there's nothing we can do about it. Not one thing. Well, yeah, so like it, you know, the case study, if we, now like, I'm going to write down five reasons that people failed. When the first reason, one of them, I don't know if it's linear, uh, I can't. Mm. Once they say that, they're stuffed. Mm. You, I don't even know if you can re-educate them. Mm. Until they're willing to give up, I can't. You can teach them every way to do it. And then they're, it's what kills off all solutions in human beings is the, word, the words, I can't. Yeah. Mm. I'm, you're done. I don't even know what we can do. Like I've seen great runners, or great swimmers. They they say they can't. They can't. Hmm. Oh my gosh, you just did it. I can't now, dude. You just did it. I can't do it again. Gosh, I don't know what I can do. They have to get themselves into it. And so all. I think this is funny. So I was just training a guy yesterday, and uh, all excuses are subtle, seductive, and believable. <laughs> That is all excuses are subtle, seductive, seductive, mm -hmm. and believable. Isn't it true? Subtle, mm -hmm. seductive, and believable. So I can't. Is he talking about being at a bar? <laughs> 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 Not the girls. Oh, so, oh, yeah. you said excuses. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so think about that. So I can't is believable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I have limitations this, that mean that I can't do yeah, this. That's believable. And yeah. I, I can convince you. I can't sure. do that. Look at my arm. Yeah. Uh, to the person that has I can't as a conversation, they try to convince everybody else. And they've already convinced themselves. Now i got to convince you. I can't do this. Look. Like my, if you don't have I can't, I've seen guys get their legs blown off. They don't say I can't. They stay in the fight. You're like, there's no way. I look at him and go, dude, the guy's putting a tourniquet on his own leg. Like, okay, that's legit. I would be cowering in fear, you know. <laughs> yeah. And they don't use I can't, so they don't get disrupted. <laughs> so one of the other excuses that's seductive is this is dumb. Huh. This is dumb. We hear you that I mean? with dumb. practice and with with role, play. role playing with the stuff this is dumb i don't need this yep and, and it's always the simple it's the it's the simple test oh, that yeah. they say that about mm -hmm. yep. <laughs> yeah this is wow. dumb has killed more progress than anything in the world <laughs> this i don't want to no i don't want to but this is dumb <laughs> i don't want to go do it again dude that kills people <laughs> i can't and this is dumb if this is dumb is in between you and what you said you wanted, then this ain't dumb. <laughs> you know what I'm yeah, saying? Like but, I don't understand how. They but end. it's so. It's, it's I, I, this is dumb, and you get there, and you can't get through it. You're like, this is dumb. Why do I have to do this? This is dumb. The other, one of the other reasons that people fail, is I call it the blame game. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't have support. My wife doesn't want me to do this. Mm -hmm. I will never be a good parent. If like mm -hmm. the reasons that people quit SEAL training, this is dumb. I can't, no support. I'll not be a good parent. I don't want to travel that much. So I get on the bandwagon called, uh, my wife doesn't support me. What do you say to the dude? Like, Hey, I'm quitting because, uh, uh, my wife doesn't really, or my girlfriend doesn't really want me to do this or my parents don't. Hmm. So when did you notice that? What week of training did you notice? That? <laughs> Just when it's getting <laughs> shitty here? Yeah. And once they come up with these reasons. Right in the middle like, of that second time in the ocean. What are you going to do? Just ring the bell. Mm -hmm. And then they have to actively go up and use the language going, I, I, I drop And you're always putting that out there as though it's, hey, this, it's no problem. It's okay. Yeah. Just, just go ring the bell. You're done. Yeah, and, it make, so the, and making it so easy for them. So yeah, I, you ever offer to carry them over to the bell? No, I don't bring the bell to you. You don't have to go over there. I'll, I'll bring it over here. I'll make it easy. <laughs> so uh, right. it, you know, it, can you, you imagine say, being in the ocean on that third <laughs> time, told to go in after the run, and uh, and him hauling a bell out to you and just being like, "Here's the bell." <laughs> well, I mean, it, but it's funny the 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 parallels because when we talk about it in business and we're talking about these things, but. 
when you talk about going back in the second time, the third time, the this is dumb takes on a whole. Oh, it's, it's not just it's not so just so believable. It's not yeah. just this is dumb that I have to practice these scripts. It's like this is dumb because this is you're talking about like it's a it's a whole nother level of this. You're talking about going into a department I mean, or an agency like we do the second yeah, third like, time. Yeah, yeah, this is dumb, but. But weren't you, weren't you just in one? How many, <laughs> you, how many times have you been in this one? Or have that we was all... the third this week. Yeah. <laughs> that was the third you did it? Or that was the third? I had never done it before. I've been done twice before. Twice before? And who did it before? Nick did it um, two years ago. And then you and uh, Nathan did it. And I know it was done by God right when I did it. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, third time in. Mm-hmm. And you probably, I don't know, how many people are in the agency? Uh, like 100. Okay, so 175, and how many policies did you sell? 113. 113. I saw 128 people. And and there's people in our organization that say it can't be done a second time mm-hmm. and get mm-hmm. any good results at all, right? And this was the third time, and he got over, over what, 60, 80, 70? What was your percentage of people met with to close? To close ratio, it was, it was like 90-something percent. It was over a hundred percent, but then the guy made me come back and see those. People. Yeah, but, but yeah, but it was ninety something percent. And, and did you see what you just did? This is dumb. <laughs> Having to go back and see those people. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So uh, what I I can see it now. This is incredible. Yeah. You know, what you know, like even predicate the whole conversation with uh, overcoming excuses. Mm-hmm. So write down all your excuses. Every time that excuse comes up, that's what you have to penetrate through Hmm. this is dumb no support tired Hmm. the other reason that uh, you know and what i see in in training people the why people don't do what they say they're going to do is so the the easy out is i forgot oh holy crime so i'm like okay so you just invested fifty thousand dollars into this Hmm. and you forgot to do the homework So what I do is I, I check people right off the bat. I want to see if you can honor your word you know, as, a, as a, a client going through training because I'm going to figure out what your reasons are in three weeks. And these reasons will kill you the rest of your life. So I make them do something at night, right before they go to bed, and in the morning. So simple things. I think they're simple. So 10 push-ups, 10 mm-hmm. squats, and 10 sit-ups. <laughs> what are the reasons that people don't do that? So I've had... Over guaranteed 300 plus people go through it and seven have completed it. <laughs> so three weeks of starting with 10, 10 and 10 night and morning. And then week two, 20, 20, 20, 20 30, 30, 30. It doesn't matter the numbers. It really doesn't. It's I irrelevant. Right? Run. Yep. <laughs> so excitement allows people to do things for about six days. And then the <laughs> excitement wears off I thought you and the reasons. Days. But I think it probably, but I don't get any feedback for seven. So, <laughs> I uh, gotcha. so what are the reasons? I forgot is the most criminal reason that comes up. Hmm. I did, oh, I just forgot. Second reason, this is dumb. Do you think I forgot's the real reason, or is that just what they're saying? No, I think people forget. Okay, it's, it's like a prioritization of value. Okay, and even things that are valuable, people forget. <laughs> sure. Like you ever, you know. Gosh, I had a phone call to make at mm. 10 o'clock, and you get busy doing something that's really important to you. Mm. I forgot. So, and that is a key indicator. So, people that use, have used, I forgot as a reason, they use it everywhere. <laughs> so, if this client comes back, gosh, I totally forgot, or I was drunk, or my arm hurts. Those reasons are the exact reasons in every other aspect of their life that they don't do what they say they're going to do. Hmm. So I started doing that now for four years, and I write these reasons down. So later in training, when something doesn't happen, I'm like, so what was the reason for that? I forgot. See, we learned that in the first three weeks. Hmm. And so, it, and that's what happened in SEAL training. Same reasons to not honor your word. So how do you come help them overcome that? How do you, as they a have coach? To see it. They have to see it because self awareness. Once they see it, once they see, and they understand the emptiness of that excuse, then they can probably more than likely it probably just sheds itself, does it? Or yeah, well, you can't overcome a problem until you see what it is. Sure. I think the problems are not hard. I don't think. I don't think. Uh, I think being successful is hard, but uh, 
the problems that keep you from getting there are so but ass simple. Yeah. I forgot is a simple so over you can overcome that. Yeah. So how do you overcome forget? Have somebody support you in what you're going to do. Mm. Call you. Well, it's a pain in the ass. Okay. So left <laughs> up to your own demise, you're going to forget, mm. get drunk, mm -hmm. whatever reason. So you, uh, one of the best solutions is they got to see that and go, gosh, dang it. How do I solve this? The moment they ask themselves, how do I do this? The solutions are available 24 yeah. hours a day. Mm. But until they see it and then they, they ask, I don't want that. How do I solve it? You can't give them a solution because you can download off the internet how to make a million dollars. People won't do it. Mm -hmm. God, that's uncomfortable. It was a pain in the ass. Mm -hmm. Well, okay. So until you want it bad enough that you're allowed to see it, then you have to ask for help, which I think is the second order of effect of success is, you know, honor your word and don't give up. And then you have to have a support network. Otherwise, left to your own demise, you ain't going to do nothing. So, so one thing that you just said, and with us, within our business, uh, a huge area for us right now is recruiting. And in that process of recruiting, I feel like we we talk to people and we we always want to know about their successes. But it sounds like what we really need to start. Tell start, us about your failures. Tell us, tell us about the times in your life where you failed and the reasons why you failed. That to me and is that will like, be I don't a know. Tale. I don't know if people can articulate it. Unless you do. But it'll allow you to... Unless you share a failure story. Okay. And they're like, wow. Okay. Okay, wow, that's cool. This they won't be willing to let that. their guard down to tell you the real... Well, you know, I, you know, so I have a divorce. If I hadn't been doing this work and training other people, you'd ask me why I'd have a divorce. I don't know if I would have been able to tell you other than playing. Mm -hmm. But if you, in an interview, share something not directing them to share exactly the same way. You know, what I know about failing or what I know about success in, in business is it takes iterative times to be successful. I, gosh, I, it took me six years to figure this out. So they're like, wow, that's cool. Do you have a story like that? Mm. Well, yeah. So now they're able to put language to it without you going to go, Oh, he's a failure. And they're like, dang. So on an interview, you always want to look successful. Mm -hmm. So I'm part of a bunch of CEO groups across the country. They only want to see how many times you've hit and recovered. Mm -hmm. I don't want to see your pedigree. Mm -hmm. That's nothing. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, when did he hear his first no? Or when did she hear the first no? no. But nobody's going to share their problems. I don't go to an interview going, hey, you know, I got divorced. You want to hire me? You know, dude. You know, <laughs> hey, I just failed out of college. Can I work for your company? You're like, next. So it's hard to be vulnerable unless the, sure. the person that is in charge goes, okay. But we, that, do, we develop people <clears throat> and we hit rock bottom and we keep going and, or whatever that conversation is. So it would be worth it to change our lingo to to incorporate some of that. Like I would be willing to share vulnerable stories or have Jill share vulnerable stories about me or you because mm – -hmm. Hey, our best guy went through a season in his life where he hit this, 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 and this, but you know, and this was an excuse he was using or not an excuse, but this was the reason he was using. Tell me about a time in your life. We could change our lingo. Yeah, that's around the, so I, that I call that the culture out. of a company mm -hmm. where, you know, you, you know, you send somebody out to do a job, you know, that they're going to hit rock bottom. Every time they go out, they're going to hear 20 no's mm -hmm. and it's available to come back and go, Hey, I don't, I tried the shit and it didn't work. Mm -hmm. You got any other solutions? And I want to quit today. Okay, cool. I want to quit today too. Come back in. Let's figure this out. Mm -hmm. But if they don't have that culture of fail to fail to win, then nobody's talking openly. Mm -hmm. And then the numbers start drying up and nobody wants to even know that the numbers are drying up and you whitewash everything. <clears throat> so a culture of fail to win. Because I can live in that one. Oh, Everybody yeah. can live in that one. Hmm. Man, I'm having trouble at home. Cool. What do you need help with? Mm -hmm. As opposed to, how's everything going? Oh, good. Really? Didn't your son just commit suicide? Or didn't I read about that? Mm -hmm. Oh, it's okay. It's not affecting me. Oh, bullshit. So yeah, right. let's hear. Let's let's get the real skinny. <laughs> yeah. And most successful cultures that I've seen, and you know, the SEAL culture, I think, is rather successful. It's based on loss and failure. No. come back 
and you know that the guys are hitting rock bottom. And then st- the staff is like, well, we want them to hit rock bottom. Then we're going to start over. Uh, and then like the Scott even brought more, the skipper of SEAL Team 6 I had on a podcast a couple podcasts ago. He was the breeder of fail to win. And, you know, so at SEAL Team 6, everything is at the level that you know, I thought I was pretty good. And then they're at a different level. Mm-hmm. You think it's success driven. It's not. We want to push this to the brink until it fails, learn from it, come back, practice what we failed, and then push it to another level. Okay, now we're 10 steps more. Now this failed. Let's come back, reiterate it, figure it out, solve it, go back and push it again. And they're doing that constantly. Not a lot of people can tolerate that level. Mm. They want to win. In the SEAL community, in training, you never win. They never (laughs) let you win. You never get a so like a, what you do is you, participation award. They don't do that. No, well, no. So not <laughs> not the award side of it, but they give you problems that may be solvable. In the middle of solving them, they create another problem that's not. <laughs> so in training, you never win. So when you go out into the real world of combat, it's the only time you can win. The only experience I ever had in SEAL training of winning was in combat. Kill him. Oh, that solved that problem. Mm-hmm. In yeah. training, we solved it, and then you know, somebody got artificially killed. Now we have to uh, drag this guy, you know, drag you for 300 yards. Mm-hmm. Dude, it's a game changer. It <laughs> yeah. takes four people to drag one guy because mm-hmm. everybody gets exhausted. Or maybe six. Yeah. And <laughs> dra- so you're like, everything becomes I've been it's okay. I've been dragging myself. That's why you're so strong. <laughs> And, but that culture, I think, is wonderful because everybody can grow in it. Everybody knows they're going to hit the wall. If yep. it's not me, you're going to hit it. Yep. And if you hit it, like, okay, his time in the barrel, mm-hmm. let's help him get through it. Yeah. yeah. I don't necessarily see that in business all the time. The cover-up. and Nobody yeah. wants to honestly or authentically deal with the problems that are, they see. Mm-hmm. But the problems aren't there's not enough money. It's pro- the problems are there's not enough business to go after. It's people have their internal problems yep, that's that it. they ain't dealing with. And it's, I can't, I won't, and all this other stuff, which I think is a unique way of looking at it. Mm-hmm. And do you think we've done a good job about that, about talking about I think we can do much better. I think we've done a good job, but I think that we can do better. Um, we are, we're pretty vulnerable uh, yeah. when we talk to all the coordinators yeah. um, and sharing our our failures and successes, but I think we can always be better. But I think, I think in that recruiting process, being able to do that and cause it's, it's being able to um, identify people's character on the front end yeah. after, before wasting 10 grand on training them to then ultimately find out what they're character One of the, is. I, I, I might, I'm not going to say I'm smart enough to know, you know, how to do anything, but one of the tests of character is that's why I put my first two, three week, you know, homework in with clients. The, the test is to honor your word, which is the biggest testament of character. Make a promise and keep it over time. You'll see that person's character very quickly. What you do when they don't, I think, is more relevant. So hmm. people don't honor their word. Is that a reason not to hire them? I don't know hmm. what they do after they are exposed, I think is the testament of character. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I forgot good try to start over, mm-hmm. no, not continue, start mm-hmm. over until you can honor your word and overcome that problem. If they can do that, they probably have good character. I've hit a problem. I've solved it and I completed it. I think that's a testament of character. Hmm. I don't know if you can do that in a two minute, one hour interview. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. A and test is always needed. What, one thing I was just thinking of as you were talking is my dad always talked about um, going through ranger school. And when my dad went through ranger school, his dad at the time was the colonel on post. Mm-hmm. And so it, he had a pretty unique experience in that everyone wanted to be the person that got the colonel's son to, mm-hmm. to quit. To, to quit. Mm-hmm. And so he, he talked about times where they would be riding on the bus to go somewhere and they would just stop the bus and tell him to get out and that they would meet him there and while well, everybody was having lunch that he would have to eat lunch on his hands with his legs up a tree and eat his 
to see with his face and uh, different things. But he always talked about treating the entire thing as a game. Uh, and, and it's funny when he talks about it, um, he, he always, w- whenever anyone is in a discussion with him about Ranger School and about being in the Ranger Battalion, when he talks about Ranger School, he, he says it's just a it's just a basic leadership training mm-hmm. school, and that's and, and his mentality was just it's it's just a game, mm-hmm. and if it, and if, if treated like one, um, then then you can get through it. And to me, that's it's like everything that we do because with our coordinators, we we put them through. There's a lot of work that goes into what we do, sure. um, and a lot of times where it's easy to quit and it's easy mm-hmm. to not. It's easy to the way our system is set up to where the number of calls you're supposed to make and another uh, the number of initial meetings you're supposed to have and these different things that we put in that are very high volume Absolutely. tasks where it's so easy to 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 stop short, but treating it like a game where there's like a, almost like a point system in that everything is it's um it's all within your realm of you can you can do it yeah you can you can 100 do it's it. just it's not just the norm. tricking yourself and yeah. yeah yeah absolutely it's not the norm and, and and it really rubber hits the road rubber meets the road whatever that saying is <laughs> when uh <clears throat> you've got somebody that works 20 hour days, three days in a row. So they've worked 60 hours in mm-hmm. three days. And that's, that's not normal in the corporate world, but that's very normal in our world. Mm-hmm. And so having somebody to go across that bridge and be able to see that that's not that big of a deal. Mm-hmm. You know, you got four hours of sleep. Give me a break. <laughs> you know, you, that see that just, yeah. you know, and when we've done more than that, what's the longest day you've ever put in? 27 hours. 27 hours. I think 27 hours inside of a jail. So yours was 27 hours. Mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure mine was more than that. Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> Probably I have think, more policies. I think it was 26 hours mine was anyway. So now I've got to go do his walk for, I'm going to do it for 30 hours instead of 40 hours. <laughs> but it's funny when you, when you say stuff like that, and people are like, what do you mean 27 hours? Like, how do you do 27 hours? I was like, I don't know. I got there at 5 and I left at 8 a.m. the next day. Yeah, that's that's literally how you do it. But <laughs> yeah, everybody asks the same question about you know doing twenty four hours or making through combat where you're awake for three days. Mm. It doesn't feel like you're awake. You, you just got to. shit going on. Yeah. So yeah. The, 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 <laughs> I th- the real key to extended effort is commitment. You got to have definable things that you're trying to accomplish. Mm. People don't have that. Yeah. A nine to five job is an indefinable objective. So if like you have an objective to write policy or run a hundred miles, everything else falls out. So it doesn't matter how long it takes. You're so committed to this process in your head. You just keep going and you're, gosh, that was 30 hours. Like I, we were awake for three days in Afghanistan, three days. I didn't feel like three days until like two days later. Like, okay, I can't even lift my hand. I can't even see colors anymore mm-hmm. but in the middle of being committed time is irrelevant and you're just eating and moving and eating and moving and doing your your job and i wish everybody would have that experience but everybody self-limits to the point where they put themselves in this objective box with indefinable or undefinable objectives and terrible terrible existence when you don't know what you're up to each day such a such a majority of such a huge percentage of people in the world have no earthly idea what they're capable of because yeah. they never even come close to ninety nine point nine 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 percent. Yeah, and so like yeah, I mean like this week, I mean my first meeting every morning was at six forty five. I left at twelve thirty a.m. the first day, eleven p.m. the second day, twelve a.m. the third day, um, and it, for us it's just like that's just what we, that's just mm-hmm. part of the. This is I mean that's just what we do. Um, and, and we talk about being like, I almost want to make fun of that schedule. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Because yeah. I've seen you do some sick stuff. Yeah. Well, in, in, in like on Tuesday, I had a two hour break in the middle of the day and I was like, what in the world am I going to do? Work out. So I went to the gym. <laughs> no, I knew you did. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it. <laughs> but, but it's so funny cause I've been, and I'll get on Facebook live throughout the day and these people are like, what in the world is this human being doing? And because it's twelve thirty a.m. and I'm in a parking lot on Facebook Live talking about what talking about selling thirty policies in the last four hours, and I'm like, why in the world would you do that? I'm like, why in the world Commitment. wouldn't you if you mm-hmm. could? Yeah. And people just have no idea what they're capable of because they're just playing it safe, yep. going through life, okay. and there's the people that they surround you. And you talked about 
um, with the excuses and surrounding yourself with people that make mm-hmm. it, make it easy to quit and make it yeah. easy to conform. Um, and so many are just surrounded by people that aren't pushing them and that it's not that they're not pushing them, but they are people that, that are making them feel super comfortable mm-hmm. with their mediocre lifestyle. Uh, and it makes them, it makes their friends uncomfortable for them to go out and push those, those limits where, I mean, for me personally, that's been a huge thing for me. Like, I don't, I haven't hung out with a friend in a long time. It's just, I just decided. I know, like, I know cause you and I are always together. <laughs> <laughs> But it's it became like I'm going to go do this, and I don't want to I don't want to have anything that just holds me back. Um, well, people are risk averse. That's what I said in the beginning when you said that they're risk averse. But what they don't realize is, ain't none of us getting out of this deal alive. You know what I'm saying? I mean, you might as well set the things in motion and go after it. Live. The only guarantee in life. That's it. That's it. It ends. It's going to be over. So. Yeah. yeah. God, I can't tell you how much well, I thanks for the learned time today. from you today and Absolutely. listening to you. I appreciate you being here. Yeah, thanks. All right, guys. So thank you so much uh, for tuning in to this special episode of the Sales Wolves podcast. I hope you got as much out of it as we did having Tom uh, here on the podcast. Unbelievable uh, information. Uh, it's As unbreakable information. Unbra- <laughs> it's unbreakable yes, and yes. unbelievable. <laughs> Before we wrap this thing up, um, you guys know how to uh, follow us on Facebook, Instagram, at Tyler Harris Page, at the Joseph Caldwell. Uh, but want to give Tom a chance uh, for those of you that want to reach out uh, and start following him, which obviously we would highly recommend. <laughs> and after watching this, if you've gotten to this point, you're going to obviously do that. Uh, so how would they find you? Yeah, you can follow us on uh, TomShay.com and on Unbreakable Tom Shea on Facebook. So guys, with that, uh, we hope you enjoyed this episode of the Sales Wolves podcast. Uh, we are super, uh, super excited to have Tom on the uh, on Thanks the episode today. Um, as always, you guys know we don't sell anything here. We're not we're not uh, asking you to buy our ebook. We're not asking you to buy our mastery course. But it would mean the world to us for you to share this video if and only if you got value from us from it. So if you can share it uh, with those that you think. Uh, would benefit from it. That would mean the world to us. And uh, with that, I am Tyler Harris. Tom Shea. Joseph Caldwell. And we are the Sales Wolves. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) That sounds, that sounds weird.